I want to welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds this afternoon. Uh, it is my pleasure and my honor to get to introduce you to some of our chief medical residents who will be giving Grand Rounds today. Welcome to our faculty, our students, our house staff, and uh, families who are joining us. Our speakers today are going to talk about uh, the most recent of our 100-year storms, uh, the COVID pandemic, and how it compares to the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic 102 years earlier. Uh, I'll introduce them. Amelia Bowman is one of our chief medical residents. She is originally from Colorado, did her medical training here at the University of Colorado, and will be a pulmonary critical care fellow at the University of Utah next year. Corey McGee is originally from Mobile, Alabama. He did his medical training at the University of South Alabama. He'll be joining us as a rheumatology fellow uh, next year. Sneha Shah is originally from Chicago, Illinois. She was trained at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And following her chief resident year, she'll be uh, staying here in Denver as a hospitalist faculty at the VA. And then Ben Trefilek is also from Chicago, Illinois. He comes to us from Indiana University for his medical training. And uh, we are fortunate enough that Ben will also be staying with us. He'll be a primary care physician at the, in the Denver Health System at the Eastside Clinic and the Webb Clinic. Um, and so without further ado, I will turn it over to the Chiefs to talk about 100 Years Apart, Lessons from the 1918 and COVID Pandemics. Thank you, Dr. Connors, for that introduction. And thank you for everyone in attendance. We're excited to talk with you about this topic today. So Amelia, Corey, Ben, and I, as the pandemic draws to a close, at least here in the United States, wanted to look back at the 1918 flu pandemic refocus on the current COVID pandemic and think about the lessons that we can take into the future to any other pandemics we'll see in the future. So today, while we have no financial disclosures, we do want to say that we stand in solidarity with countries like India and those in South America where COVID rages on and countless lives are being lost. With that, we wanted to start with a case so imagine that you're seeing a 42-year-old, otherwise healthy male who presents with high fevers, severe headache, a cough, and shortness of breath. Upon examination, he appears cyanotic and in distress. And if I were to ask you, what do you think is the next best step in management? Many of you may say, well, give the patient supplemental oxygen, try preemptive self-proning. Perhaps he needs intubation. Let's start him on some antibiotics and see what happens. And all of these would be great choices, except now imagine that you were seeing this patient in 1918, where his symptoms came on without warning, heralded by a sudden shivering, a severe ache in his head and eyeballs, and then he collapses. He has high fevers with a cough, and then his, turn, his face turns ashy purple, in which case the physicians knew that death was imminent. Imagine being a physician in 1918 and seeing all of these young patients not faring well. And so at this time, let me pose a question that we will revisit at the end of the talk. If the physicians of 1918 were to time travel and arrive at the start of the COVID pandemic, perhaps they'd be impressed by the medical advances we've made, but do you think they'd be impressed by how we've handled the pandemic otherwise? What advice would they give? And these are some of the questions we asked ourselves and would like to discuss with you today. So our objectives today are to evaluate the similarities and differences between the 1918 flu pandemic and the COVID pandemic. We'll be discussing the political, social, and economic effects, and then hopefully considering some policies and lessons that could assist in recovery from the COVID pandemic, as well as any future pandemics. So before we get to the future, let's look at how these pandemics began. So the 1918 influenza pandemic started in March of 1918, when many countries were enmeshed in World War I. The pandemic started here in the United States at Camp Funston, which was an army encampment for soldiers training to head off to Europe to fight in World War I on behalf of the United States. And as many of you must recall, the COVID pandemic began in December 2019 in, Wuhan, uh, in the city of Wuhan in the Hubei province of China. Now, a side note, throughout this talk, you may hear the 1918 flu pandemic be referenced as the Spanish flu. This terminology is derived from the fact that Spain was a neutral country in World War I. They had no censorship and therefore widely publicized the grave illness of King Alfonso. And this created a false narrative that Spain is where, may, where the pandemic may have begun or that Spain was particularly hard hit, neither of which is true. <clears throat> 
Similarly, uh, we refrain from calling COVID names such as Wuhan virus or China flu um, and such similar names which are considered derogatory. And so thinking a little bit about the virology of the two pandemics, the 1918 flu um, was caused by influenza A, specifically H1N1 subtype. H1N1 also caused the swine flu in 2009, as you may recall. In contrast, COVID is caused by the coronavirus. Coronaviruses that infect humans are typically of the alpha or the beta subtype, and all the coronaviruses that have caused pandemics have been of the beta subtype, including the SARS-CoV-1 in 2004 and the MERS pandemics in 2012, 15, and 18. Now, there's a stark difference in the genome sequences between the two. Most notably, the first whole genome sequence that was done was of a small bacteriophage in 1976. So obviously no such capabilities existed in 1918. In fact, physicians thought that the 1918 pandemic was caused by Haemophilus influenza, which is a bacterium and not the influenza virus. It wasn't until 1996 when we were able to recover and um, sequence some degraded RNA viruses found from preserved tissues of the 1918 victims. And in between 1996 and 2005, the full genome was sequenced and we received the full genome 87 years after the pandemic. In dramatic contrast, we had the full genome sequenced of the coronavirus a mere two months after the pandemic began. And in less than a year, we have more than 100,000 full genome sequences for around, from around the world, giving us some incredible insight into the virus that we're battling. As far as the timeline and the spread goes, the flu pandemic occurred in three waves. The first wave uh, did spread throughout the world, was, but was a herald wave with mild symptoms and low morbidity and mortality, causing people to think that this virus was simply the seasonal flu. It wasn't until the virus then migrated to, the, to Europe, thought to have been mutated there and caused a significantly more deadly second wave, and then after a third wave, the pandemic ends. And as we know, COVID continues to this day and has occurred in similar waves. A word on the spread of the virus. And so while we know the 1918 flu began in the United States, it quickly spread to Europe from the soldiers that were going overseas to fight in the war. There, as I mentioned, the virus mutates and causes a second wave as seen by the blue arrows. Um, and mentioning that Europe has been a particular hub in both viruses in 1918 due to World War I. And with COVID-19, um, it played a large part as a central hub between Asia and North America. I mean, as you might recall, Italy was particularly hard hit after the pandemic began as Europe being the central hub. And now the B117 variant from UK is prominent across the world as a more contagious third wave. As far as epidemiology goes, the 1918 flu pandemic was certainly more deadly than the current COVID pandemic with more people infected worldwide and approximately 50 million dead. There are some debates about how many uh, died, but all of those numbers have thought to be underrepresented given poor census tracking abilities. In the United States, approximately 600,000 uh, people died. The current pandemic continues though uh, with fewer deaths worldwide um, and a similar number of deaths in the United States. The case fatality rate for COVID is yet to be determined, but for flu is thought to be up to 10%, which is very high. Notably, as you might recall, COVID-19 at the beginning of the pandemic uh, was afflicting um, populations in the older age ranges where highest morbidity and mortality was seen. In contrast, the 1918 flu had a W-shaped mortality curve where the youth or younger adults were also afflicted, thought to have been due to um, the army encampments and overall the younger age of soldiers fighting in World War I across the world. If we think further about the epidemiology, in 1918 and at the end of that pandemic, India had suffered the most mortality or most deaths with approximately 20 million of the 50 million total deaths. If we apply this death rate to the current world population, this generates a staggering number of mortalities. Approximately 150 million people worldwide would die with 6.5 5 million alone in the United States. And so fortunately, COVID has not been as devastating to the world as the 1918 flu was.
And so thinking about how much unclear COVID-19 would have been had it occurred in 1918 is something important, but we know that currently we have much more advances in the medical technology. And so let's look at how these pandemics were managed. And so in 1918, given that um, antibiotics hadn't yet been invented, that we had no capabilities of understanding the bug or the virus that was infecting the United States and the world, and there were no oxygen capabilities. And so treatment was really relegated to prevention. Many such pamphlets were um, found from that era where doctors and um, the Treasury Department here talks about how to prevent the virus from spreading. The Red Cross here is asking people to wear a mask, and in, in their own words, they report that a man or woman or child who will not wear a mask is considered a slacker, their words, not mine. And finally, this pandemic also prompts further investigation into the use of medical oxygen. Dr. Barrick here writes a paper in 1922 where he mentions that the rudimentary oxygen delivery systems being used um, throughout the flu pandemic were only delivering about 2% additional oxygen and were really not helping the patients in the way that they should. And this pandemic really sparked much more investigation into how we can use supplemental oxygen as a therapeutic intervention. So in contrast, COVID, of course, many of us have managed. Um, and in today's modern medical technology, we have many ways to deliver oxygen to the patient, including intubation. We have advanced antibiotics and antiviral therapies. We can even bypass the lungs and put the patient on something like VV ECMO. And all of our treat therapeutic choices have been backed by robust trials and data, including uh, for example, remdesivir and dexamethasone. If these therapies don't work, we can even offer lung transplantations for the appropriate candidate. And finally, with advances in, model, in modern medicine, we can now prevent the disease from worsening and spreading with the vaccines being uh, developed less, in less than a year since the pandemic began, a feat that's impossible to imagine in 1918. And so with that, now that I've laid a foundation for you for the two pandemics, let's, let's turn to Drs. McGee and Bowman to discuss um, the two pandemics as regards the media, politics, and public health. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. So um, I want to actually discuss the effect of the local government response in the two epidemics. So with COVID-19 and the 1918 flu uh, epidemic, there was more variability between US cities compared to the European, which was mostly due to the local government responses compared to the national responses. Some cities were quick to set up measures to mitigate the spread of the 1918 flu while others were delayed. These delayed responses ended up being detrimental to the local populations. Take for instance, the cities on the two extremes, Philadelphia and St. Louis. Philadelphia's first case was identified on September 17th, but they did not implement mitigation measures until October 3rd. Over that time period, they had the fourth Liberty Lone Drive Parade on September 28th, which is pictured on the left. The parade had over 200,000 people in attendance and was done to encourage the purchase of US bonds to fund the war. Philadelphia had 31 hospitals and within 72 hours of the parade, all of their beds were full. By October 3rd, 2,600 people had died. In a week following that, the total was 4,500. They had an estimated influenza mortality of 719 per 100,000 citizens. Compare this to St. Louis, whose first case was October 5th, and they implemented mitigation measures on October 7th. They had an estimated influenza mortality of 347 per 100,000, which was half of Philadelphia. The one caveat of these mitigation measures is that they never lasted more than eight weeks, which made these cities susceptible to second waves. The same variability was seen with COVID-19 with implementation measures being quicker in some cities once cases were identified as well as some being more stringent. The picture on the right is a picture of New Orleans during Mardi Gras at the end of February, 2020, when there had already been 57 documented cases in the US. This ended up being a super spreader event. And New Orleans became one of the hardest hit areas. A lot of the influence in the local response, especially in 1918 pandemic was influenced by the media's portrayal of the pandemic. Print media was the main source of information at this time. It was very influential. Early media response in both pandemics looked to downplay the severity and how much Americans should worry. The image from the left was in the early part of the 1918 pandemic where they described the death rate as extremely light. 
On the right is a tweet from the news source Fox who said this pandemic was not going to be deadly. This, also, this same um, uh, um, thought process was also prevalent in other literary sources. In September 1918, Literary Digest stated that the pandemic usually occurred after two to three days with rapid recovery and was of no serious consequence to the young and healthy. However, as it became more evident of the deadliness of the 1918 pandemic, the news began to emphasize the seriousness, but this was quickly followed with some comments to downplay it as not a cause to panic. This article was written at the peak of the 1918 pandemic in October. It talks about the old grip, which was the term for the flu at that time. They discussed treating, treating with supportive care and emphasized that, emphasized that this flu outbreak was nothing new and something that doctors have treated for years. Interestingly, they do emphasize calling the doctor in the very next line, but make sure to end by saying not to panic. This theme was not isolated to this article and was stated in the Boston Globe in October 1918, which like I said earlier was during the peak where they said, fear is man's worst enemy. Whether he fights Germans or germs, the man who is worried is already half beaten. There was also a physician at this time who was quoted as saying, it is our duty to keep the people from fear. Worry kills more people than the epidemic. Public health officials were also labeling this as the same old flu we have always treated. These contradictory responses were a consequence of the political atmosphere and led to a distrust of the media, which Dr. Bowman will, will elucidate more on. Thanks, Dr. McGee. In order to understand the contradictory media response to the 1918 influenza pandemic, it's important to understand the political climate of the time. In 1918, the United States, along with most of Western Europe, was actively fighting World War I. Although the world was in its final, final months as influenza pandemic began to spread around the world and ravage US cities, war and preparation for war had shaped politics in the US for years. Two of the most important factors shaping US politics as the pandemic struck were the Espionage Act and Sedition Bill passed in 1917 and 1918 respectively. The stated purpose of this legislation was to prevent any attempts to interfere with operations or success of the US armed forces, prevent any obstruction of military recruitment, or avoid anything that would hurt sales of Liberty bonds. These laws made it a crime to aid any nation at war with the US, including expressing opinions that cast the US government or war effort in a negative light. In addition, it gave the Postmaster General broad discretion to impound or refuse delivery of any mail he felt would harm the US war effort. Despite this apparent infringement on democratic values, President Woodrow Wilson and his administration were able to generate a broad base of support. This support has largely been attributed to mistrust of immigrants, especially recent immigrants from Western Europe. Between 1900 and 1917, over 900,000 immigrants entered the US each year. The vast majority coming from Western Europe and the largest proportion of this majority coming from Germany, the US's main adversary in World War I. Wilson and other supporters of the Espionage Act and Sedition Bills argued that recent immigrants could not be trusted to support war against their country of origin. And this lack of support could undermine US war efforts, possibly even strengthening Germany. Together, the Espionage Act and Sedition Bill effectively curtailed free speech, forbidding disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the US government, flag, or armed forces. This crime was punishable by a $10,000 fine or up to 20 years in prison. And as many US citizens soon learned, it was not an idle threat. Two striking examples of enforcement were William C. Edenborn and Eugene Debs. Edenborn was a naturalized US citizen from Germany originally, who operated a railroad business in New Orleans. Uh, he was arrested after making a public statement that Germany was not a threat to the US and ultimately released several days later without charges. Eugene Debs, however, was not so fortunate. He was a leader of the Socialist Party who was convicted of undermining conscription efforts after giving a speech against the war in June 1918. As punishment, he was imprisoned from June 1918 to December of 1921 and permanently stripped of the right to vote. Enforcement such as this was possible as a direct result of the Committee on Public Information or CPI. 
This agency was established by President Wilson to systematically reach every person in the US and generate support for the war. The agency frequently embellished the truth to accomplish its goals, going so far in one instance as to use photographs of British planes to claim the US Air Force had, had arrived in Britain. The deceptive use of this photograph, as well as many other misleading statements, were exposed and ultimately served only to undermine public confidence in government and media. More powerful than any media campaigns by the Committee for Public Information, though, were the in-person efforts of their volunteers, the Four Minute Men. These men gave four minute speeches at the start of community events around the in nearly every community around the country to promote patriotism and support the war effort. In addition, they closely monitored local newspapers and often exerted editorial control over any topic with the potential to quote, hurt morale. In this way, Wilson and his administration effectively controlled what was published in nearly every newspaper around the country at a time when newsprint was the sole source of information for the vast majority of Americans. Clearly, the influenza pandemic had the potential to hurt morale and therefore received scant and often blatantly misleading coverage in newsprint. This disconnect between the reality experienced by citizens affected by influenza and the newspaper reports again undermined public confidence in the media. This mistrust was only amplified by the striking silence of the federal government on the topic of influenza. Not, it was not until late September 1918, well into the second wave, that the Surgeon General issued advice on how to avoid the flu, seen here on the left side of the screen. As, as Dr. McGee mentioned earlier, the emphasis of most government and public health messaging was not to panic. The public health recommendations not to panic could frequently be found in the same paper, sometimes even on the same page as desperate advertisements pleading for additional healthcare workers in city, cities struggling under a surge of flu cases. And while the public may have looked to the executive branch to offer comfort or even guidance, they would find none. In fact, Woodrow Wilson never made any public or private statements on the influenza pandemic. In contrast, during the COVID pandemic of 2020, US citizens had almost innumerable sources for information and President Trump saturated multiple media platforms with frequent and sometimes contradictory statements about COVID-19. In addition, public health officials frequently updated or changed recommendations as scientific understanding of the coronavirus developed. While updating and refining a hypothesis is central to the scientific method, when combined with frequent contradictions and reversals in the messaging from the federal government, the ultimate result was a public mistrust and confusion about the pandemic. Just as in 1918, the absence of a clear national policy on the pandemic meant every state county and town had to develop their own policy related to COVID. This led to a hodgepodge of inconsistent policies that were not always based on the best scientific evidence available. As in 1918, the federal government hoped to control the pandemic by controlling messaging around the pandemic. However, infectious diseases cannot be controlled by the media. Only careful public health efforts and rigorous scientific in inquiry can halt a pandemic. Both in 1918 and 2020, the public health failures of the federal government allowed influenza and COVID to penetrate every space of American life, including the White House. Now, Dr. Trefleck will discuss some of the other spaces most impacted by both pandemics. Thanks so much, Amelia. When we look at ways that we connect to our ancestors from 1918, perhaps there's no better way than to look at the economic impact of both of these pandemics something that all of us to varying degrees are affected by. Comparing these economic impacts is a difficult task. For one, not surprisingly, our economies are drastically different than they were 100 years ago. This is shown pretty clearly when you look at the top 20 most common jobs in 1918, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You'll see such mainstays here as stenographers and typists, bellboys and butlers, and my personal favorite, broom button and rubber factory operatives. Almost half of these jobs 
the ones I've listed here, employ a fraction of people in 2020 or are completely obsolete. On the flip side, nearly half of the most common jobs in 2020 didn't even exist in 1918. Things like truck drivers, software developers, and although registered nurses uh, existed back then, they were certainly in the early stages of becoming a mainstay occupation. Another drastic difference between our economy now and the economy in 1918 is our government's ability and willingness to implement policy to mitigate an economic disaster. In 1920, the Young Federal Reserve was barely five years old. And like many of my colleagues have said, at this time, their primary focus was on World War I, specifically selling liberty bonds. Between using famous celebrities such as Charlie Chapman, using parades, large ad campaigns, they raised over $20 billion, but none of that was used as, de as designated relief for the influenza pandemic. In contrast, the modern day Federal Reserve and government uses ample strategies to help mitigate an economic collapse. Some of these include lowering interest rates, which were cut to essentially zero at the start of the pandemic, payment protection programs, offering loans for small businesses, and quantitative easing, essentially a process where the Federal Reserve will buy assets to infuse more money into the economy. So how did these two competing strategies work out? During the recession of 2008 and 2009, there was newfound interest in evaluating how macroeconomic disasters, or the things that we know as depressions, affect, were affected uh, the US economy. A group out of Harvard published all the data on these disasters since 1870. The three largest economic disasters are things that you'll certainly recognize. World War I, the Great Depression, and World War II. What they were surprised to find is that shortly after World War I, the fourth largest economic disaster was seen. Often called the Forgotten Depression, the Depression of 1920 to 1921 saw unemployment reach double digits, farm incomes and industri industrial production collapse, and the Dow Jones, Dow Jones Industrial Average was nearly cut in half. To put these numbers into perspective, consumption was nearly down 16% and GDP was down 12%. Again, this is the fourth largest depression in modern US history. It's important to recognize that during this time, there were ample confounding variables. Like we've talked about, the world was just getting through the First World War. There were arguably economic policies in place that worsened the depression. And like we're all talking about during this presentation, the world was recovering from the influence of 1918. In 2020, the same group at Harvard tried to compare mortality data attributable to the war and estimated that a worldwide decrease in GDP of about 6% could be directly impacted by the influenza of 1918. For reference, the Great Recession in 2008, we saw a decrease in GDP of only about 4.3%. So it's clear that following the pandemic of 1918, we saw a massive worldwide decrease in economic activity. And an estimate suggests that about half of that decrease could have been directly attributed to the influenza. So how has our modern economy been responding to COVID-19? There's ample ways to evaluate this. Possibly the easiest way is to look at GDP. And it's important to acknowledge that going into the COVID-19 pandemic, the United States was coming off its longest recorded economic expansion in US history that actually started way back in 2009 following the Great Recession. In March, like we all are aware, public health measures and social distancing went into effect to help curb the pandemic. And not surprisingly, this led to a massive contraction in the US economy. In fact, during the second quarter of 2020, from April to June, we saw the steepest quarterly drop in GDP on record, a drop of 9.1%. For some added perspective, no drop greater than 3% has ever been recorded in a single quarter in US history. This massive contraction in the economy is reflected in the unemployment rate. In April of 2020, the U.S. unemployment rate rose as high as 14.8%. Those are numbers not seen since the Great Depression. The economic shutdown was a crisis for all workers, but the impact was certainly greater for women, non-white workers, lower wage earners, and those with less education. As you can see in this graph provided by the U.S. Census Bureau, Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black families reported disproportionate income shocks following the economic shutdown. This is essentially measured by having an income decrease or income eliminated from a household. Furthermore, as you can see in the green column, families with children were disproportionately affected as well. Aside from unemployment, retail sales were particularly impacted during the early part of COVID. 
Following the initial shutdown, it's not surprising that we saw almost a 22% decrease in retail sales, which you can see by this dip in the blue, in the, excuse me, the purple bar. This massive decrease in sales also led to a massive increase in personal savings. And in April 2020, U.S. personal savings rate actually recorded its highest level on history. What's interesting is that growth in retail sales actually regained almost all of their losses. And by August of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, retail sales were actually 2.6 percentage points higher than August of 2019, pre-pandemic levels. So what does this point to when we think about economic recovery, as now we're almost a year out of the start of this pandemic? In regards to GDP, as mentioned, we saw the largest quarterly drop to 9%. But much of this economic contraction is actually recovered, and by the end of the year, the U.S. GDP losses were about 3.5%. Real consumer spending, another great measure for the economy, has also rebounded substantially. And the unemployment rate continues to improve, and is currently about 2.6 points higher than pre-pandemic levels. We expect that this, this economic expansion will continue, and in fact, the International Monetary Fund predicted that the economy would expand 6% this year. That would be the fastest expansion in the global economy since 1980. So great, the economy is recovering, consumer spending is up, unemployment is down, but this certainly doesn't paint the whole picture. Like many things about this pandemic, the economic recovery has not been equal and has disproportionately affected certain groups. This chart here demonstrates some of the disparities in economic recovery. As you can see, high wage earners, so people earning more than $60,000 a year, the unemployment rate has completely recovered and in fact has slightly improved from pre-pandemic numbers. The same cannot be said for middle age, middle wage and even less so for low wage employees, people making less than 27,000, where employment rates are still almost 25% less than they were pre-COVID. This unemployment gap continues to widen a wealth gap that already existed between high and low wage workers. To compound this, non-white workers, specifically black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans were significantly more likely to lose their jobs during the early part of the recession. This difference was particularly noticeable for minority women. As you can see by this chart, Asian, Hispanic, and Black women were over two times more likely to lose their jobs during the early part of the pandemic compared to their white male counterparts. And these unemployment disparities have a direct impact on food and housing security. In fact, the amount of households with children reporting food insecurity has nearly doubled since before the pandemic to about 32% of households in July of 2020 reporting some aspect of food insecurity. As you can see here, these rates are even higher among Black and Hispanic households. It will be important as we move towards continued economic recovery that we continue to advocate for policies that ensure appropriate aid and relief for individuals and families that were most susceptible to the recent economic downturn. Moving on from the economy, it was impossible not to feel a deep, deep connection with our ancestors as we flipped through page upon page of newspaper clippings. This shared human experience, while distressing, can also be comforting. As an avid college basketball fan, I can vividly remember watching the St. John's Creighton game get canceled at halftime as COVID cases started popping up around the country. There was some comfort reading that Bucknell and Penn State fans back in 1918 were probably equally disappointed to hear their beloved football rivalry get put on hold. Or as I'm driving home on East Colfax and seeing the historic Bluebird Theater close for the past year, I found a strange solace reading the Chicago Tribune's report of how the Chicago Opera fans had to put their plans on hold almost 100 years ago. Speaking of music venues, perhaps nowhere do we see the resilience and connection between us and our ancestors than in the music written during these challenging times. Whether it's Willie Johnson performing Jesus is Coming Soon, or 21 Pilots singing their 80s theme COVID pop song Level of Concern, or South African composer Ruben Kaluza instilling a sense of direction for his country with his song Influence in 1918, or rapper Lil TJ singing Ice Cold, a song that chronicles the struggle of isolation over the past year. The voices of each of these generations echo similar sentiments of despair, but also of hope human spirit, and resilience. Speaking of resilience, here we have three women, Angelita Friedman, Jerry Schaubles, and Hester Ford. Three women who lived through both the 1918 influenza pandemic and COVID-19. They are true embodiments of the shared human connection between us and our ancestors. 
I'd like to highlight Hester Ford, shown at the bottom right, who passed away in April of this year at the age of 115 in Charlotte, North Carolina. As a Black American, her experience through each of these pandemics was unfortunately intensified by racial inequities that persist to this day. For historical context to these racial disparities, I'll turn it over to Dr. McGee. Thank you, Dr. Trafalek. So we would be a do, doing a disservice, not to mention the most glaring aspect of COVID-19 that also occurred during the 1918 flu pandemic, the health inequities in the African-American experience. Even though they were discriminated against, Black physicians and nurses were key in providing care during the pandemic. Black physicians were called upon to become the major health care providers, while white physicians were called overseas to take care of the servicemen on the war. Unfortunately, they still had to prioritize their care to white individuals instead of their black peers. Black nurses looking for acceptance in the U.S. Armed Forces of Nurses after being exclude, excluded from the World War I service by the U.S. Army Medical Corps were on the front lines of the flu pandemic, taking care of the infirm from the flu and putting their lives at risk. The picture on the right is a group of black nurses outside of a house. There was actually sparse data assessing the uh, racial differences during the 1918 pandemic. The African-American community had higher all-cause mortality and morbidity during this time period, but the limited studies show that there was actually lower incidence and in morbidity, but a higher case fatality with the 1918 flu. And on the left is a picture of a Black hospital ward during the 1918 pandemic. White public health figures, specifically the Chicago Commissioner of Public Health, extrapolated this to mean that the colored race was more immune than the white to influenza. Unfortunately, this was far from the truth with the main causes likely, or likely being early inoculation from less virulent strain in the first wave to black tenants living in alley districts, which were high occupancy tenant houses with poor sanitation and ventilation. These black alley districts were formed from discrimi discriminatory housing legislation. In addition to these early exposures, there was uh, likely significant underreporting from inherent disp disparities in ethnic data collection that likely led to lower total, total mortality. The black community leadership knew this perpetuated lie to be untrue. In addition to community efforts through church bulletins and town updates, black print media like Afro-American, the Chicago Defender and the Philadelphia Tribune rebuked these lies acknowledging the lower mortality in black community compared to their white counterparts, but said that the black community was far from immune and should take proper precautions. The black community relied on itself to support its members without the US government support. This lack of, lack of effort from the US and local governments to help the black community only further the distrust of the governments. So what I wanna leave you with is a quote that emphasized the frustration of the African-American community, which I will let all of you take a minute to read. So as William Pickens notes here, when Negroes die faster, it is often ascribed to their inferiority, but if spared, well, that proves they're not human like the rest of us. In the present climate, Dr. Hammonds, a professor of African-American studies at Harvard University, echoes Pickens. She states, yet the dearth of data about the fate of the Black population in the United States during that long ago ordeal bespeaks a deeper problem, one that persists to this day as the nation grapples with the stark racial inequities exposed by the coronavirus pandemic. The study of the impact of, on communities of color in 1918, in particular African-Americans, was often relegated to footnotes. It wasn't seen as the center of the story. Unfortunately, the center of the story remains the ongoing inequities and injustice. From the one year anniversary, anniversary of George Floyd's murder being yesterday to the numerous reports demonstrating the gap between white uh, Americans and those of BIPOC, Americans are demonstrated here. For example, if you compare the COVID-19 cases by population in the United States, you note that African-Americans as well as Latinx populations are at higher risk to get COVID-19 cases in proportion to their uh, percentage of population in the United States. This is not true for white Americans. 
In contrast, right in our backyard in Denver County, while white Americans make up 67% of the population, nearly 80% are vaccinated. The same cannot be said for our Black or Latinx populations, where the vaccination rates lag behind their percentage in the population. And so let me repose the question I asked at the beginning of this talk. If you, if all of us could time travel to the next pandemic, say in another 100 years, what advice would you give? Following are the three lessons that the speakers think we've learned during the examination of the two pandemics that should not be forgotten. So the first lesson we've learned is a concerted effort by the federal and global governments are needed. We cannot die in a leadership vacuum again. We cannot tolerate leadership failures of the magnitudes that were seen in the two pandemics we discussed today. There must be a collaborative effort, not only globally, but federally and locally, where the voices of the infectious disease and public health experts are at the forefront. We must fight a pandemic together, not only globally, but nationally. Secondly, we feel that individual responsibility comes in play at a high level. As you can see in this newspaper clipping from 1918, when quarantine rules were established, they asked you, the individual, to enforce them. If the children as little as two year old in um, Alberta, Canada can wear their masks appropriately, then why can't we? We felt that in lieu of discussing detailed policies or um, examples of how better to help their economy recover, none of those things would be possible if we can't simply follow these first two lessons. And lastly, perhaps the biggest lesson of all is that we must go from inequity to justice for all. As Dr. Fauci noted, the enemy was the virus, but it seemed that we were too busy fighting each other instead of fighting the virus. And let me be clear, there is no hope of successfully overcoming a future pandemic until we overcome the most pervasive pandemic of all, social injustice. And so let us begin to value the other as much as we value ourselves. Let us rise together. And with that, we thank you for being present and are eagerly um, awaiting any questions or comments. Thank you very much, uh, Chiefs. That was an incredible topic uh, and it was a masterclass in presenting a difficult narrative. Uh, that was absolutely fabulous. Thank you very much. There are, as you can imagine, a lot of questions. Um, for better or for worse, they are all very difficult and hard to grapple with uh, as these topics are, but I think I'll throw them out there and, and let's see what you have to say. Um, since there's a lot of speakers, I'll try to direct the questions as best I can. Amelia, so I'll, I'll start with you on this one if you don't mind, and then um, we'll throw this out to anybody who wants to comment. If you look at the two pandemics, you know, maybe think back to 1918, how do societies recover? when they experience these turns away from democracy or away from truth or away from faith in the media, you know, what, what, did, what happened after 1918 that allowed us to feel like we had faith when this pandemic hit as well? Yeah, thanks for that question. That is certainly a tough one. Um, I think um, there, I didn't find any great, there's not one specific event, I would say. I think Looking at the history and the timeline though, um, the end of the pandemic co coincided pretty closely with the end of World War I and the creation of the League of Nations and a feeling that the world was moving towards a better, more peaceful and more just future. Um, and so though, although though the events, the disparities, the atrocities that were experienced in the US in the setting of the pandemic were never directly addressed, I think the trauma of World War I and the closure that folks um, were able to experience thanks to the end of that um, battle helped everyone come together and move towards the next step in their lives. That's great. Any other thoughts from the group? I don't wanna, I don't wanna jump too quickly to, to other challenging ones, although that's an excellent explanation. Yeah, I think I think just kind of going off, I think it, it all comes down to like when when the national government fails you, um, I think what the black community in 1918 did that was so strong is they came together to look out for one another. And I think I think when your national government is failing you, you, you have to rely on your local community to be your support system. And um, 
And I think that's that's a hard task to ask of anybody. But um, I think in I think that until things get kind of um, more centralized, I think that's what you have to do. Corey, jumping off that thought, there's another question about, um, I think something you mentioned in terms of St. Louis versus Philadelphia and you should modern examples of New Orleans, which is uh, how do people maintain a sustained response to a sustained problem? And it's not obviously an easy thing, but some cities did it better than others. What, what might have been the hallmarks of the cities that did this well? Yeah, and and that's that's a uh, that's that's another hard question to uh, answer, and I think it's a great question. And like you said, the, the and kind of looking at the as like reference the um, social distancing and mitigation measures that were instituted in for certain instance Denver, Denver lasted almost probably fifty two weeks compared to eight weeks back in nineteen eighteen. And you know how do you how do you continue that and um, that's a hard one. I, I honestly, I just kind of from my like limited experience and in seeing interactions and what seems the people who seem to have the best response is, um, I think going by the science and being very deliberate in which mitigation measures that you um, do and act. So when um, whatever institution or whatever um, whatever seems to be safe to open up. I think doing that and just giving people something instead of holding every, just instead of when you cut everything off and just stop the economy, stop people's lives, that is really hard to adjust. And I think that's a kind of a, something that's easy for us to tell people to do, but in implementation, it's very hard. And so honestly, I think going by the science and then being very thorough and deliberate and understanding what measures you need to keep and what measures you can retract and to piggyback off what Corey is saying, um, in 1918, they in fact did not have the science to back themselves up. And I think given that arena, they did a, an excellent job of, of masking, of social distancing, shutting down schools and churches. And I think had that population been present during COVID, the uptake of, of universal masking, the uptake and agreeing to close things down would have been much more universal um, as well. And so I think, uh, I think the population back then actually did a great job of masking when they were asked to. Unfortunately, science just didn't know, hey, should we mask for two weeks or four weeks or 10 weeks or for how long should we keep this going? And I think that's what backfired for them. But even during the second wave, when the second wave begins um, and mask mandates come back, everyone takes that up um, as, as much as they're, they need to. That's great, thank you. Um, Totally changing gears here. There's a question about oxygen. Uh, and so I'm going to throw this one to Sneha. Um, somebody says that, you know, while we think about all these other things, remdesivir and steroids, and, and, you know, I just came off service and was talking to the interns about vent settings that we just never use anymore, but we tried them. Tell us about oxygen. Uh, this is obviously the most fundamental things and everything else is trying to deliver it, but we don't always think of it as a medicine. Yeah, absolutely. And, and neither, neither does the history of oxygen really think of it as until really robust, um, you know, trialing it as a therapeutic intervention starts. And so um, initially, um, oxygen was really thought to be, you know, this gas and combustion. And then thereafter, there seemed to have been more sort of um, adverse effects with oxidative stress. And so people didn't really think we should be using it in addition to just what we breathe in the ambient air. Um, around the early 1900s, they did start using oxygen for surgeries, and I think just didn't really think to translate that to medical patients. Um, I think partially because they likely didn't know the pathophysiology of what was going on in the lungs. Um, they saw an autopsy that lung tissue was destroyed, which was likely a result of ARDS back then, um, or superimposed imp infections, but they just weren't able to do that live time. Um, and use that surgical oxygen in patients in medicine. Um, and so Dr. Barrick really starts this um, oxygen therapy and respiratory therapy path. Um, he's a big leader in that field. And, the, and, and, sin, and since that time, there was a big boom in oxygen technology. Um, there's great data out there about the um, 
the types of masks and oxygen delivery systems that were used. Um, a lot of these devices were sort of full face and you were very claustrophobic. Um, and then ultimately sort of in the 1950s when we first start to develop intensive care units is when we see um, the more novel sort of nasal cannula methods um, and it uh, progresses from then. That is great, thank you. And maybe a, a slight um, offshoot on that question. So I, I did introduce you as being from Chicago. I know you were born in India. Uh, what does it mean when a country runs out of oxygen? What, what does it mean for India right now? I think it's frankly heartbreaking to see physicians who could have easily been you or me to be practicing in that setting. Um, and I imagine you're seeing what the physicians of 1918 saw, the case that we presented where you see patients die in front of you with now what we know to be a very central therapy and something that could help patients. Um, and I think it means a global failure in controlling this pandemic. Um, we, the four of us have agreed that we won't get into our personal politics for this uh, talk, but I will say the national government of India has also failed its people um, in controlling the pandemic. Um, that could have been curtailed by now. So I think it's, um, for me personally, pretty heartbreaking to see what's happening. Um, and not only me and my family, but many of my colleagues who are also Indian um, have felt some losses. Yeah, thanks for reflecting on that. I know it's, it is, uh, it's very challenging. Um, ben, if I can ask you a question about something that you brought up that comes from our audience here. It was this idea of resilience that you mentioned um, and, and the reopening of things. So if you think, if we can think back to 1918 or what you learned in studying that, how do people come to trust one another again? How do they come out of their houses? How do they all go to the Bluebird um, when it's safe? Is that something that was a, a, a quick on off switch? Did it take a long time after 1918? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So sorry, it, it did not, it was not a quick fix. Um, and things like mask wearing, uh, things like uh, going back to concerts. The if you look at like the Metropolitan um, had about like an 85, an estimated 85 million dollar loss back in 1918. They weren't able to recoup that for several years into the mid uh, to late 20s. And part of that had to do with there was a pretty significant depression, so people just didn't have the money or the means to do things. Um, but it takes it takes it takes a while. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think judging kind of how the past few months have gone is we'll see a similar um, similar slope. Some people wearing masks, still staying at home, some people, you know, eager to get out. Um, but yeah, it was not a, it was not a quick fix. It definitely took took time. It was compounded, you know, then you know, on the bookend, the other bookend of this was a second world war where um, that came, you know, 10, 15 years after the end of this. And uh, you know, for better or worse, that may have even accelerated kind of reintroduction back into uh, quote unquote normal society. Um, I have a question that I think is um, probably, uh, Corey, you mentioned it, although anybody can talk to this, and it's about the um, healthcare disparities that, that you talked about so poignantly at the end of the talk. Um, and the question is about vaccination rates and what we're doing here in Denver. You know, when you see those rates that are lower for the communities that, that probably need them most and that are in our ICUs most frequently, what are we doing to combat that? So I, I guess I'll kind of take a, a first little bit of stab at this. And this is this is also a incredibly hard and incredibly complicated subject that's got a lot of layers on it. And I think this kind of goes back to the history of um, anybody that's gone to medical school and understands the history of uh, uh, the medical institution and how it's failed on uh, how it's failed the minority population and how there has been a building distrust and understanding um, how we can repair that um, repair that distrust that has just only grown over the years and um, that and, and that and um, kind of doing what I know um, hospitals have have been doing, which is great, is going to the community itself to vaccinate vaccinate um, individuals um, that are especially underrepresented in these um, under vaccinated um, under vaccinated populations. And I I think just being aggressive and finding leadership and getting out out there and going to individuals to vaccinate them. 
in the same vein, um, having the leadership in these communities to um, squelch any squelch these these distrust of um, distrust against the healthcare system is incredibly important as well. I don't know if any of my other colleagues have any thoughts. Yeah, I know Jeff. Oh, go ahead, Amelia. Oh, I was just going to add. I think I completely agree with Corey. I think. Um, we've had some powerful examples recently, um, people like Patrice Harris, the recent president of the AMA, um, who was able to personally talk with her African American community and try and squelch some rumors. Um, and many, many public figures who um, displayed how when they got their vaccines. Um, I think one of the lessons to me in looking at 1918 and comparing and contrasting with uh, 2020 was recognizing the importance of setting aside any agenda when faced with public health crises and rather emphasizing facts, emphasizing what you know as well as what you don't know. Um, because I think when you say something with too much confidence or when public health officials make one recommendation and change it, it's things like that that although unavoidable, um, certainly engender mistrust. Yeah, I think I you had a say, yeah. yeah, I was going to say similarly, I think there have been a lot of grassroots uh, efforts in our communities to reach out to the Hispanic or Spanish speaking population around. And I think language barrier is a big deal if um, all the PSAs are in English um, and as a Spanish speaking patient, you have questions or misconceptions about what the vaccine is. I know these grassroots roots efforts um, in combination with the Salud Clinic have done a great job reaching out to our Spanish speaking population, um, answering any questions. Um, and I've heard a few stories on NPR now regarding sort of these one-on-one -on -one interviews about how a patient had gross misconceptions of the vaccine, what, what the vaccine was. They're at the clinic, the person who talks with them, answers all their questions, and then they go ahead and get their first shot then and there. And, you know, and so these grassroots efforts speaking to patients in their proper language um, is helpful. That's great. I think there's a, a follow along question, um, and maybe it's it's for all communities or for the minority communities, which is concerns about the safety of vaccines. You know, some people will say, well, we don't know the long term effects. And, and obviously, we don't know the five year effects of something that's six months old. That's that's obvious. Um, is there concern in the communities about getting these vaccines? And, and how do we overcome that concern? Yeah, uh, so I can just speak, I, and I, I don't, I, that's a really hard question. It's something that I think we've all seen. We're all practicing physicians who, who see this in our clinics all the time. Um, and, and I don't know if I have, if I have the best option, I, I, the best answer for that. I think when you look at, you know, prior, you know, vaccine history and vaccine development in the past, is that rarely have we had a vaccine that's come to market that has downstream effects, you know, five, 10 years afterwards. So there's not really a physiological reason to believe that anything coming out now would also have those long-term risks. Um, but it, at least in my clinic, you know, when I'm seeing patients talking about COVID, that's definitely the question that I'm combating the most. And I don't, at least I don't have a great, you know, best answer for it. And I don't think we have like a historical precedent to, to help us to help navigate that. Definitely not in 1918, we did not. Yeah, I think that's very fair. And this, uh, this actually came up in the ICU and we had a discussion with a family recently about, well, we don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine and we don't know the long-term effects of COVID. Uh, we do know one of those has a chance of hurting you today and one of those is very safe today. And, and so I think, yeah, there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a balance issue where we have imperfect information, which is not unfamiliar to doctors. Mm -hmm. And so I'll throw yeah, this out. I'm oh, oh, sorry, Ben, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, there was in the annals of internal medicine, um, even before the vaccine came out last year, they did a, they did a survey basically asking people's willingness to get vaccinated and like a huge determinant of people's willingness was their perceived perceptibility of, of uh, risk to themselves of getting COVID. And obviously people who thought that they were not at risk. And unfortunately, um, for a, a lot of reasons, a lot of times those are underrepresented minorities who um, have, a, have a decreased perception of risk. And a lot of that comes from mistrust, you know, historical mistrust of the medical system. Um, so definitely, like when you're talking to those people, we, you know, we know COVID can hurt you now, but if you don't perceive that risk, uh, the, the push to get a vaccine that may hurt you five, 10 years from now, it's really, it's a really tough conversation. I totally agree. And maybe we'll throw this as a, a quick round table in the last minute. 
um, since the talk was called Lessons Learned. Um, and Amelia, I'll go ahead and start with you if you don't mind. What, what if you want to each throw out what is one of the, the key lessons that we can say we now know this from two pandemics? I would circle back to kind of what I mentioned earlier um, and just flush it out saying, I think transparency um, on the side of um, government officials, public health officials, we know this about the virus, we don't know this, um, as well as an honest effort to improve kind of just scientific literacy. Um, so the population at large understands the scientific method, method and understands that when we believe one thing but get new evidence, it's okay to change what we believe. Um, and it that's different from changing an opinion. Thank you, Corey. I mean, I was hoping you're going to give Sneha Ben next. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, you know, honestly, for me, um, I, I think the 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 lesson I've learned from this is, as much as it's easier to make quick responses on a local and statewide level, I think a centralized response is key to um, consistency across the um, across the U.S. Every other country does a centralized response, and I think um, setting a standard so you don't go from one state to the next, one city from the next, or one county from the next, there's not different standards for you, I think is incredibly key. I think it just shows this, I think looking back on COVID-19 and just seeing the states that were aggressive, aggressive and mitigation measures and um, were more successful than those that weren't. I think just making a centralized approach is very key. That's great, thank you. Ben, your thought? Yeah. I'll take a little bit of an, of an economic lean on this, that uh, one thing that I learned looking back at 19, so COVID is deadly, influenza is deadly, but so is poverty. And in the future, we know public health measures uh, can curb the infection rate, but if we don't find a way to provide individual aid to people that are most at risk uh, to have an economic downturn after those interventions, then we're failing them just as much as we're protecting them from COVID. Um, so I think, you know, especially now, as if we don't find ways to provide uh, pointed aid towards people that were economically devastated by this pandemic, um, we'll, we'll have failed them regardless. So, and I think we saw that in 1918 during the depression of 1920 and 1921. That's great. And Sneha, I'll give you the final word. I think what I've learned from looking back at the two is that, um, personal opinions or personal truths when weighed against scientific fact will not weigh as much. And so we have to listen to the experts um, in order to be successful at beating the invisible enemy as opposed to each other. That was great. Well, thank you, Dr. Shah, Dr. Trefleck, Dr. McGee, Dr. Bowman, truly a magnificent presentation. Thank you all.